Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is January 31, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 42. Eight days ago Jimmy Carter delivered what is sure to be his only State of the Union message to Congress and the Nation, and in some ways his speech truly reflected the desperate state of our Union. In a feeble effort to call forth echoes of John F. Kennedy and FDR, Carter spoke of a new foundation as the theme of his wandering administration. This phrase, taken from the old Bolshevik anthem, the Communist Internationale, is a fitting title for a government that is now far gone in a quiet Bolshevik revolution. Last June he said Russia must choose between confrontation and cooperation, but since then America's military plight has gotten steadily worse, and in his State of the Union speech Carter said, it is a myth that we must choose between confrontation and capitulation, and just for good measure he repeated the same lie his administration has been giving out now for 16 months ever since the Battle of the Harvest Moon, and that is, nearly all issues of SALT II have been resolved. And while he was at it, Carter also said, I am grateful that in the past year, as in the year before, no American has died in combat anywhere in the world. Yet only two months ago the Jonestown mass murder in the Battle of Guyana took place to wipe out the secret Russian missile base there, and there were American soldiers who did die there. Their coffins are still at Dover, Delaware, unclaimed. As he spoke, Carter was heavily medicated for pain. His cancer is still getting worse despite frequent cobalt treatments for his so-called hemorrhoid problem. Meanwhile, the cancer in his head, which I first reported four months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 38, is not being treated and is growing rapidly. It now engulfs an area about 3.5 by 4 inches inside his left temple and around the left eye. By March the effects should be publicly visible in his unusual behavior. Soon the 25th Amendment to the United States Constitution will come into play again when Carter dies, resigns, or is removed for incapacity. But the man who had hoped to benefit again from his own 25th Amendment, Nelson Rockefeller, has just passed from the scene forever. My three topics this month are Topic No. 1, The Decline of the House of Rockefeller, Topic No. 2, The Bolshevik Plot for a Pope's Revolution, and Topic No. 3, UFOs, IFOs, and Russia's Master Secret Weapon. Topic No. 1. As war clouds were gathering over Europe and Asia in the 1930s, four men in America were gathering the reins of worldwide power. These men were the third generation heirs to the most powerful dynasty the world has ever known, the Rockefeller Dynasty. They were the four Rockefeller brothers, John D. III, Nelson, Lawrence, and David. There was also another brother, Winthrop, as well as a sister, Abby, but Winthrop cared little about world power and intrigue, and so long ago he was cast aside by the other four brothers. Winthrop went his own way, and eventually spent two terms as Governor of Arkansas before dying in 1973. Meanwhile the other four brothers were taking the very fate of Western civilization into their very own hands. As I've detailed on many past occasions, they played key roles in bringing on World War II and using it to expand their empire. In speeches during the war their father, John D. Rockefeller, Jr., described the carnage as a great crusade. In glowing terms he painted it all as well worth the suffering, death, and tragedy for millions upon millions. The Rockefellers believe in the old Chinese proverb that opportunities arise out of crises. But as I reminded you last month, World War II was really fought over oil, and as a wise old friend of mine once said, oil is thicker than blood, so long as it is the other fellow's blood. As the moans of World War II slowly died away, the four brothers surveyed the vistas of world domination that seemingly lay before them. World War II had shattered their most important rival in oil and world power, the British Empire. At the same time, 
the secret Rockefeller Soviet alliance had emerged stronger than ever, an indispensable key to their future plans. And best of all, the oil treasure house of Saudi Arabia now lay firmly in the Rockefeller grasp. Using their unprecedented profits from Saudi Arabian oil, the Rockefeller cartel was soon to outstrip all financial rivals worldwide. For three decades following World War II, the worldwide power of the Rockefeller cartel expanded without let-up under the hands of the Four Brothers. Politically, economically, and militarily they appeared to have the Midas touch. Their plans, unknown and unsuspected by the general public, usually went off without a hitch and right on schedule. Through deliberate no-win wars and fabricated American setbacks in foreign relations, the secret Rockefeller Soviet Alliance made steady progress toward their joint takeover of the entire world. At the same time, beginning in 1961, the brothers set in motion their Machiavellian two-pronged strategy for an eventual wartime double-cross of their Soviet allies. In this way the brothers were planning to finally pick up all the marbles for themselves. Their goal was nothing less than to rule all of the planet Earth through a one-world government. With the dawn of the 1970s, the four Rockefeller brothers were embarking on the final decade of their plan to seize control of the world. They were determined that the goal be reached within their own lifetimes. Secret joint plans with their Soviet allies were right on track for a carefully programmed thermonuclear war in the late 1970s. The war, Nuclear War I, was being programmed to involve the United States as the prime battleground. So to get ready for the war, the brothers were rapidly transferring as much of America's real wealth including our gold and our technological know-how, into their own coffers overseas. America was being turned into a hollow shell, impressive on the surface but ripe for a shocking defeat by the Soviet Union. And yet, in a secret final twist, America's moon program was setting the military stage for Russia's destruction as the climax of the coming war. There appeared to be nothing to stop the Four Brothers, but then within the past several years things began to go wrong. They began making mistakes, and slowly but surely events began slipping loose from their former iron grip. Three and one-half years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 2 I pointed out some of the early symptoms of this slippage in Rockefeller control. Barely a year later, in the summer of 1976, their carefully drawn plans began to be torn apart. Suddenly the secret Rockefeller Soviet alliance of nearly 60 years was being terminated unilaterally by the Kremlin. The still secret underwater missile crisis of 1976 was underway, as I reported in AUDIO LETTERS 14 through 16. As my older listeners know, this crisis led to my meeting for more than an hour with the late General George S. Brown, then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The meeting took place on September 16, 1976, in General Brown's office at the Pentagon. In AUDIO LETTER No. 16 I reported that meeting to my listeners. Thanks to the brave leadership of General Brown, the United States had been spared a surprise nuclear attack, and now there was a golden opportunity to completely stop America's march toward nuclear war. But the four brothers simply could not believe that their secret alliance with their Bolshevik allies in the Kremlin was gone for good. In the autumn of 1976 they did not yet understand that the Bolsheviks themselves had lost control of the Kremlin. That would not become clear for another year, and so they began trying desperately to appease the Kremlin in an effort to restore the alliance. An early victim of this insane effort was none other than General Brown. Within weeks of my meeting with him he was cut down by the controlled major media and passed rapidly into obscurity. In AUDIO LETTER No. 23 I detail just how much General Brown had sacrificed for his loyal service to America, and for those who have heard what I warned about then, I can only point out that General Brown did not actively serve out his term as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, nor did he live long. Then came the worst miscalculation by the four Rockefeller brothers and their intimates. 
It led to disaster in space in September 1977. As I described that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, the Russians succeeded in wiping out the Rockefeller ace in the hole for the coming nuclear war. In the Battle of the Harvest Moon, September 27, 1977, the crew of the secret American Beam Weapons Base in Copernicus Crater were killed by a Russian neutron particle beam weapon. It was fired at the moon from Earth orbit by Cosmos 954, a manned Cosmos Interceptor Killer satellite. Four months later, Cosmos 954 made an emergency landing in northern Canada. It was described in the news as a nuclear satellite crash. The Battle of the Harvest Moon was only the beginning of a complete revolution in the military equation between Russia and America, because during the final months of 1977 Russia began deploying all three legs of her still secret space triad of military weapons. The first leg of the space triad are the manned Cosmos interceptors, that is, killer satellites. During the six months following the Battle of the Harvest Moon, they began methodically destroying America's fleet of spy satellites over Russia. That led in April 1978 to the Korean Airliner Intelligence Mission over northern Russia, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 33. Immediately after the Battle of the Harvest Moon, the Russian manned space program suddenly sprang to life. Suddenly the Russians began launching one batch of cosmonauts after another into orbit, setting new records and accomplishing new feats of all kinds. Meanwhile, without publicity, Russia's first manned landing on the moon took place. The landing was made on October 16, 1977, on the backside in Jules Verne Crater, and by late the following month, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 28, Russian charged particle beam weapons were already operational on the near side of the moon. These Russian moon bases can blast any visible spot on Earth in less than two seconds and they constitute the second leg of the Russian space triad. On December 2, 1977, the third leg of Russia's space triad announced its presence to our surprised leaders. On that day, tremendous airquakes, loud blasts in the atmosphere, began rolling in from the sea along America's east coast. In AUDIO LETTER No. 29 I describe the amazing Russian hovering platforms responsible for these blasts. Like the other two legs of the Russian Space Triad, these hovering platforms, called Cosmospheres by the Russians, are armed with charged particle beam weapons. All of these secret weapons were unleashed operationally with blinding speed by Russia just over a year ago. They ruined the original Rockefeller plan for a carefully programmed Nuclear War one to end with the surprise destruction of Russia, and they drastically altered the military balance between East and West. As a result, the leadership of the four Rockefeller Brothers in their worldwide power structure began to be seriously challenged over a year ago. They had made mistakes, and their judgment was no longer accepted so easily by their most powerful associates and allies. At the same time, something had to be done, and quickly to respond to the altered situation. For these and other reasons, Rockefeller power has increasingly been turning toward support for a sophisticated new Bolshevik revolution here in America. This began more than a year ago. In February 1978 I reported that Rockefeller doors worldwide were about to be thrown open to Red China in the fight against Russia. Today. We hear all about America playing the so-called China card, but as I told you six months ago, China is actually playing the America card. China's goal is a restored alliance with Russia on the best possible terms later on. More than a year ago, the four Rockefeller Brothers began using these and other stopgap measures, trying to save their dynasty from utter ruin but they have been trying to swim against the current of history. Last June I pointed out the historical fact that all true dynasties have a natural lifespan of approximately 100 years. By that standard, the end of the Rockefeller dynasty is inevitably at hand. The very next month, July 1978, 
the lights began going out in the house of Rockefeller. The oldest of the four brothers, John D. III, met his fate allegedly in an automobile accident, and a bizarre accident to say the least, near his estate in Pocantico Hills, New York. That month I reviewed the true legacy of John D. Rockefeller III. Now hardly six months later the second oldest of the four brothers has abruptly left the scene. The true legacy of Nelson Rockefeller remains as I reviewed it more than three and one-half years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 1. But just five days ago, on the evening of January 26, 1979, he died. My friends, in life Nelson Rockefeller craved publicity, yet his death is shrouded in obscurity and unanswered questions. Normally it is customary for the body of an important public personality such as a Senator or Vice President to lie in state so that the public can pay their last respects. This service was offered to Nelson Rockefeller's family here in Washington by the United States Senate leaders and was rejected. So there was no lying in state, no formal viewing at all. Instead he was accorded a hasty cremation, an unusual step in the case of the Rockefellers, and a strictly private memorial service. Originally. It was announced by Rockefeller aides that the cremation would take place Monday morning, January 29, day before yesterday. This was to be followed by the memorial service at 11 a.m. Meanwhile, reports about the circumstances of Rockefeller's death have been contradictory and strange, raising one question after another. In response, Rockefeller spokesmen have kept changing their story from one day to the next. And as the questions multiplied, the cremation was hurried up. It was performed a day ahead of time on Sunday morning. Later that day a family spokesman announced the cremation to reporters, but he at first refused to identify the crematorium that was used and gave no explanation for the rush involved. There had been no change in the plans for the memorial service, which was still scheduled for the next day. My friends, the strange circumstances surrounding the death of Nelson Rockefeller are not just a morbid puzzle. They have to do with the fate of the United States and of Western civilization. He was one of the most powerful men on earth, and by his own choice a public figure. Like the mass deaths in Guyana two months ago, Nelson Rockefeller's death will affect your life and mine. Just as happened with Guyana, a smokescreen of maneuvers, changing stories, and confusion are being used to hide the truth about his death. But just as with Guyana, I believe you have a right to know the truth. At first the mass media chanted in unison that Rockefeller died of a heart attack while working at his desk on the 56th floor of Rockefeller Center. The time of death was said to be 10.15 p.m. Friday evening. January 26, 1979. By the next day, however, a conflicting story emerged. It was said that he had died not at Rockefeller Center, but at a townhouse located at 13 West 54th Street. According to the New York Times for Sunday, January 28, neighbors and passers-by reported that when the ambulance arrived, a woman in an evening dress emerged from 13 West 54th Street and accompanied the attendants as they carried Mr. Rockefeller to the vehicle." Unquote. By Saturday afternoon the official story changed to the townhouse address. The Washington Post said on Sunday, January 28, quote, Rockefeller collapsed in his first floor office in a townhouse at 13 West 54th Street at about 10.15 p.m. Friday and apparently died instantly, family spokesman Hugh Morrow reported. It was initially reported by Morrow that Rockefeller had suffered his heart attack in his 56th floor office at 30 Rockefeller Plaza." Unquote. The Post then quotes Morrow as saying, Actually, the death occurred in Mr. Rockefeller's private office. The error was entirely mine. Unquote. But now there were new questions. People wondered who was the mystery woman in the evening dress. Family spokesman Morrow said he did not know of any woman being present at the time of Rockefeller's death, according to the Sunday New York Times. Instead, he said that the emergency number 911 had been called, quote, 
by an unidentified woman neighbor." Unquote. Reportedly the only call for an ambulance was made by means of the 911 emergency number, and even more serious questions boiled up in this connection. For one thing, this number is for use by the general public in police and fire emergencies, and as New Yorkers know, it is rarely answered promptly, and yet there has been no report of so much as a call for a private ambulance. And still Spokesman Morrill said by Saturday afternoon that a bodyguard and a chauffeur had been with Rockefeller at the time of death. Even worse was the question of the delay before the call was placed. Rockefeller's spokesman kept saying that Rockefeller had died at 10.15 p.m., even after they changed their story about where he died, but police records showed that the 9-11 call was not placed until over an hour later at 11.16 p.m. During the missing hour, Rockefeller aides worked feverishly, making arrangements to prevent any autopsy from taking place. By the next day, Sunday, January 28, Rockefeller spokesman Morrow delivered his third version of the story to the press. According to the New York Times for the following day, he said, quote, that the death actually had occurred at about 11.15 p.m and that the two people present when Mr. Rockefeller was stricken at the townhouse were Andrew Hoffman, a security aide, and Megan Ruth Marshak, a 31-year-old staff assistant on Mr. Rockefeller's recent art projects. Miss Marshak, who resides a few doors away at 25 West 54th Street, placed a call to police within a minute after Mr. Rockefeller was stricken, Mr. Morrill said yesterday. On Saturday Mr. Morrow had said he did not know of any woman being present." Unquote. Even the age of 31 given for Miss Marshak by Morrow later turned out to be wrong. But with this newly revised story, another Rockefeller spokesman said Sunday, according to the New York Times the next day, that there was no discrepancy in the hour. It was simply a case of people under pressure making a mistake. Unquote. And also according to the New York Times, Spokesman Morrow also told reporters that Miss Marshak arrived at the townhouse for work around 9 p.m. Friday evening, quote, wearing a long black evening gown, unquote. But most important of all is the question of the cause of death. And by the time Spokesman Morrow gave his third version of events to reporters on Sunday, January 28, the Rush Rush cremation of Nelson Rockefeller had already taken place. The chance that an autopsy might allow the truth to leak out had been eliminated. Here too confusion reigned supreme in the public announcements. For example, the New York Daily News for Sunday, January 28, reported that it had learned from a member of the family, quote, that Rockefeller had been complaining of chest pains for the last week or so, but no one, it was reported, thought the pains were significant and little attention was paid to them, unquote. Yet elsewhere in the flood of Rockefeller items in the same newspaper there are the words of Dr. Kenneth Ryland, Rockefeller's personal physician for 40 years. He is quoted as saying, I examined him last Wednesday, and he was in excellent shape. I was shocked, completely shocked." Unquote. As in the case of the strange death of Nelson's brother John D. III last July in an alleged automobile accident, we may never know the full details about Nelson Rockefeller's death. Even now the young female aide who was with John D. III at the time of his sudden death is still in seclusion. She is in a hospital in Westchester County, New York under heavy guard. And now Rockefeller spokesmen are trying to hide the truth about Nelson's death. As a result, their statements reported in the press media are a study in confusion. But my friends, there was no confusion about what was to take place late that Friday evening, January 26, 1979. As is always done in intelligence circles, the psychological profile of Nelson Rockefeller had been studied. It would show that it was often his custom, after dinner with his family on Fridays, to leave to go to his private five-story townhouse at 13 West 54th Street for whatever purpose. It would also show that on these occasions his regular large contingent of armed guards would be off duty. On that Friday evening he made his usual trip to the townhouse. There he became preoccupied with doing what he had gone there to do. The moment came when his guard was completely down, and at that precise moment a shot was fired. 
The bullet tore into Rockefeller's head with professional accuracy. After the shooting, his 25-year-old female aide apparently collapsed in a semi-state of shock. At last report she is said by Rockefeller's spokesman to be in seclusion and unavailable for comment. As I say these words, the Rockefeller cover-up efforts are continuing, but new questions and glaring inconsistencies keep arising. For example, Rockefeller spokesman Hugh Morrow said for nearly two days that he did not know of any woman being present when Rockefeller died, but just yesterday the New York Times said that, quote, The Associated Press yesterday reported that at 4 a.m. Saturday, less than five hours after Mr. Rockefeller died, one of its reporters, recalling that Miss Marshak had worked as a Radio AP news reporter in Washington before being hired by Mr. Rockefeller, had called her seeking a radio report on his death. She declined to make the radio tape, the Associated Press said, but told the reporter that Mr. Morrow was with her in her apartment and might speak to him later." Unquote. When asked about this by the Associated Press, Morrow reportedly replied that, quote, Whatever Megan said at 4 a.m., I'm not going to comment on it. I've been through this thing over and over again, and I'm tired of it. Unquote. The two remaining brothers, Lawrence and David, believe they cannot afford to let the truth be generally known about Nelson's death. It would raise too many questions at this critical time. The greatest protection for their power has always been the false halo of philanthropy. That tranquil image would be shaken to its foundations by public knowledge that Nelson Rockefeller was murdered, and so because of the ugly head wound his body was cremated with dispatch and his death attributed publicly to a heart attack. The once mighty four-man unit comprised by the four Rockefeller brothers is now very badly crippled. David and Lawrence will need desperately to have someone join their inner family circle as a replacement for Nelson Rockefeller, and as it happens, the man most likely to don Nelson's cloak of power is already conveniently at hand. In fact, he was with Rockefeller only hours before his death. He is the man most responsible for America's disastrous intelligence gap, as I discussed at the Pentagon over two years ago with the late General George S. Brown. Several years ago a former CIA officer described this man to me as, quote, a little Hitler waiting in the wings, unquote. And now after 25 years as Nelson Rockefeller's political protégé, he now has a chance to become a member of the inner family circle of the Rockefeller family, and if he does, which is likely, he will be the man who will have gained the most from the murder of Nelson Rockefeller. His name? Henry Kissinger. Topic No. 2. Here in the United States the death of Nelson Rockefeller stole some of the headlines from another major event which is drawing to a close. On Friday afternoon, January 26, just a few hours before Rockefeller was killed, the man who parades as Pope John Paul II arrived in Mexico. Today, after five tumultuous days there, he is returning to Rome. It was five months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 that I first alerted my listeners to the drastic changes that were afoot in the Roman Catholic Church. Pope John Paul I had been elected just the previous day, but as I explained then, Bolshevik influences within the Vatican were preparing to throw the Church into their fight against Russia, which has wrestled free of Bolshevik control. And Pope John Paul I, soon known as the Smiling Pope, vanished from the scene barely a month later. In AUDIO LETTER No. 39, I explained how he had run afoul of the Bolshevik game plan and what had happened to him as a result, and last month I revealed that his successor, the real Pope John Paul II, has also been eliminated. In his place there is now an actor, a man who is neither Polish nor Christian, who is doing the bidding of his Bolshevik masters. He bears a close resemblance to the man he replaced but there are visual clues to look for. Close-up photographs of this actor should be compared carefully with those taken in October 1978, immediately after Cardinal Watiwa was named Pope. As identification experts know, 
A person's ears are almost like fingerprints in their uniqueness, and you will discover that the ears, along with other detailed features, are not the same now as they were at first. Since making public the tragic destruction from within that is taking place in the Catholic Church, I have received heartbreaking letters from Catholic priests everywhere. They have confided in me about their torment because of the Bolshevik control, which is spreading like cancer throughout the Catholic Church. From my own past experience, I share their deep sadness. To report the machinations of Bolshevism in the Church is painful for me. But, my friends, the central and dominant issue facing men of goodwill today is that of the satanic forces rampant on planet Earth. In this vein, some Catholic priests have revealed their fear to me that to remain in their priestly positions would jeopardize their faith itself. Last month I pointed out how important publicity is for the actor Pope in the anti-Russian game plan of the Bolsheviks. Describing this game plan, I said, quote, These days the actor Pope is the most visible Pope in history, made so by the controlled major media." Unquote. And early this month, on January 6, the New York Times echoed this very theme in an article titled, John Paul's Winning Ways. The second sentence read, quote, He has become the most highly visible Pope in modern history sallying forth from the remoteness of the Vatican every few days and charming the crowds, from school children to old people and from nuns to soccer players." Unquote. Ironically, the same article adds later on that, quote, He plays to different crowds with the skills of the former actor that he is. Unquote. My friends, the actor Pope is being used as a Pied Piper. Strictly as a tactic, he is singing a tune of progressive conservatism that is music to the ears to untold millions of Catholics. Yet his two major themes, religious freedom and human rights, are actually centered on man, not God. With this clever counterfeit of the real message of Jesus Christ, deadly politics is being disguised as religion. And the Catholic world, entranced by the tune of the actor Pope, is already being led down the path toward the Bolshevik slaughterhouse of war against Russia. It was 14 months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 28 that I was first able to reveal the revolutionary change that has taken place in the Kremlin. The atheistic Bolsheviks, who all but destroyed Christian Russia 60 years ago, have been overthrown after a struggle of six decades. In their place are the self-styled spiritual communists, an old and extremely tough Christian sect of native Russians. And as I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 36, these new rulers of the Kremlin are actually in the process of discarding Communism in everything but name. Instead, their basic political viewpoint today is that of a strong Russian nationalism, as I discussed in AUDIO LETTER No. 28. So in a descriptive sense, they would be more accurately called spiritual nationalists. The overthrown atheistic Bolsheviks are in a frenzy to cut down Christian Russia again before the last vestiges of Bolshevik influence can be expelled. They know that their time is short if Russia's holy war to wipe out Bolshevism is successful. The Bolsheviks know that the heart of Russia is spiritual. And so they are trying to rip out the heart of Russia by means of a spiritual attack. Already the actor Pope is working feverishly on overtures to the Eastern Orthodox churches, hoping to reunite them with the Roman Church after fifteen centuries of separation. And the real target in all of this is the Russian Orthodox Church. Before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the Russian Orthodox Church was infiltrated by the Bolsheviks. Today, Bolshevik influence is fast being weeded out in Russia, but if the plans of the Bolsheviks and the Vatican succeed, it will be restored as a weapon against Russia. All of this is tied to the secret American first strike strategy, which I exposed in detail in AUDIO LETTER No. 37, and the just-ended visit to Mexico by the actor Pope is part of an elaborate strategy to throw Eastern Europe into bloody revolution against Russia. 
on January 24, just hours before the actor Pope left for Santo Domingo in Mexico, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko had a two-hour audience with him. Vatican officials said they could not recall such a long, intensive audience between a Pope and a statesman. No statement was issued about what was discussed, but I can reveal that the actor Pope pretended to show his concern for Catholics in Russia. Gromyko, however, argued in effect that the Pope not rocked the boat in Eastern Europe, saying that the moves underway by the Church will destroy Christianity, not help it. Then the actor Pope left for Latin America. At his elbow throughout the trip was Giovanni Cardinal Benelli, a close friend of Henry Kissinger. As I revealed last month, Benelli is the key Bolshevik agent in the Vatican, and he went along to write the script for the actor Pope to follow. The papal trip to Mexico was a tremendous publicity stunt and a prelude to the confrontation with Russia. The heavy news coverage surrounding the trip served to build a much broader public awareness of the actor Pope's image as an anti-Communist. At the same time, the visit to Mexico was a preview of the Pope's scheduled trip to Poland next May, and as such it was well calculated to send nervous shivers up the spines of government officials in Warsaw and Moscow. In Mexico, as in Poland, the government does not officially condone the Catholic Church. Instead, for historical reasons, the Mexican Constitution imposes stringent limitations on Church activity and power. Yet in Mexico, just as in Poland, the population is about 90 percent Catholic. And so when the Pope decided to go to Mexico, the Mexican government had no practical choice but to allow him to come. Furthermore, Mexican law forbids churchmen to preach in public or even to wear clerical garb in public, but these restrictions were clearly unenforceable for the Pope. To limit his visibility that way would have invited riots and mayhem, and the government knew it. For Mexico, the only practical thing to do was to wink at the law and give the Pope free reign during his visit. But for Poland the situation is not so simple. The public intention of the actor Pope is to visit Poland for the 900th anniversary of the martyrdom of St. Stanislaus. To most Americans, having little idea who St. Stanislaus was, this probably sounds remote, irrelevant, and therefore somewhat tame. But to the Poles the symbolism and emotional tensions involved are enormous. Uh, the actor Pope is the look-alike of the late Carol Cardinal Watiwa of Poland. Before becoming Pope last October, Watiwa was the Archbishop of Krakow. Nine hundred years ago, St. Stanislaus was also the Archbishop of Krakow. Watiwa was widely known among Polish Catholics as a man who stood up to the government, even back in the brutal days of Stalinism. And nine hundred years ago, St. Stanislaus repeatedly spoke out in defiance of the king. He even excommunicated the king for cruelty to his subjects. Nine hundred years ago this May, St. Stanislaus was sought out by the King and killed for his defiance. And this May the actor Pope is scheduled to appear in Krakow to climax observances on the date of the anniversary of the martyrdom. Since this past September the Vatican has been engaging in tactics designed to steadily build up tensions in Poland. And since Christmas Day the rising tensions have been focused around St. Stanislaus Day because in messages to Polish churches just before Christmas, the actor Pope urged that the St. Stanislaus observances begin Christmas Day and continue until May. The Warsaw Government is trying to figure out how to keep the lid on in the face of the feverish tensions that will apparently exist by May. But the final key to the Bolshevik plan is a stratagem which even the actor Pope himself does not suspect. If all goes according to plan, he will arrive in Krakow after first filling the streets with crowds that will dwarf those seen in Mexico. There in Krakow, during the observances of the martyrdom of St. Stanislaus, the actor Pope himself is to be assassinated. The Bolshevik conspirators will arrange to make it appear that the Russian-dominated Warsaw regime is at fault, and agitators will whip up the crowds. 
it will provide the classic triggering incident for revolt, and the Pope's revolution will be on. It will erupt in Krakow and spread like wildfire throughout Poland, and if the Bolshevik plans are a complete success, the Pope's revolution will spill over into Hungary, 67% Catholic, and to other Catholic strongholds of Eastern Europe. The Bolsheviks believe that by lighting the fires of revolution at Russia's front door, they will be able to continue to keep the Kremlin off balance. And if Russia has her hands full trying to put down the Pope's revolution, they reason, Russia will be in no position to go to war. Like America's shotgun diplomatic marriage to Red China, they expect the coming revolution to buy more time for their panic rearmament for Nuclear War I. But, my friends, the Bolsheviks are wrong, dead wrong. If they do succeed in their plans to stay in Eastern Europe with a sea of Catholic blood, it will not stave off Russia. Instead, it will be the last straw for the Kremlin. As Russia's rulers see things getting out of hand, they will realize that their advantage over the West, all things considered, has stopped increasing at that point. Seeing that further delay is no longer on their side, they will wait no longer. The remaining moves on their pre-war chessboard will simply be abandoned. Contrary to Bolshevik expectations, the Russians will not try to put down the Pope's revolution before going to war. Instead, they will shift quickly to a full war footing. Their first priority will be to destroy the United States and other pockets of Bolshevism worldwide, using their space triad with devastating effect. Only after the war will they try to pick up the pieces in Eastern Europe. Topic No. 3 One year ago last month a loud air blasts at sea began shaking homes and frightening thousands along America's east coast. For a while Government spokesmen tried to just ignore them, but the booms now known as airquakes would not go away. Next they were ridiculed in the controlled major media, but that tactic quickly changed too because too many people were hearing them to accept it all as a big joke. Finally, after these airquakes had been going on for several months, the Government tried to explain it all away by blaming the whole thing on freak weather conditions. Alleged experts were trotted out to impress the public with a mumbo-jumbo about unusually cold air layers. Waving their arms about these weird weather conditions, some tried to say that the booms were due to military aircraft, perhaps a hundred miles out to sea. Others managed to keep a straight face as they told us that the booms were caused by the Concorde supersonic transport. Somehow they said the shock waves from the plane were striking America's east coast more than an hour ahead of the plane itself and with incredible force. Explanations like these were ridiculous on their face, yet many Americans, eager to be pacified, accepted these insults to their intelligence at face value. Most of the vast number of airquakes taking place nationwide were kept out of the press and people calmed down. Even many of my listeners tried not to believe the truth about the airquakes, which I made public shortly after they began in AUDIO LETTER No. 29 for December 1977. They were caused by newly operational Russian Cosmospheres firing their particle beam weapons in a defocused mode into the air over the Atlantic Ocean. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 29 there were seven Cosmospheres hovering over the United States, but in the months that followed the numbers of Cosmospheres grew into the hundreds worldwide. Now that the media lid is on the airquakes, a government-sponsored study of them by the MITRE Corporation has been quietly released. The report, released early last month, lists 594 airquakes between December 1977 and the following June. By June, of course, those alleged freak cold air layers of last winter had to be long gone. The study does its best to blame the boons on aircraft noises anyway, but 181 airquakes were impossible to link, even artificially, to any acceptable excuse. 
so the report lamely concludes that they must be of some natural origin. It wouldn't do, after all, to admit the real cause. The Cosmospheres, my friends, are Russia's version of the hovering weapons platforms about which the late General Thomas Power tried in vain to give a warning 14 years ago. General Power, former head of Air Force Research and Development and then of the Strategic Air Command, knew what he was talking about. In AUDIO LETTER No. 32 last March, I reviewed in detail the efforts of General Power to warn the American people, but as with many others who have tried to alert us over the years, his efforts were suppressed and ignored. As the numbers of Cosmospheres have multiplied worldwide during the past year, UFO sightings have likewise been mushrooming. As in the past, some UFO sightings today are just that, unidentified flying objects. But nowadays it would be more appropriate in many cases to call the sighted objects IFOs, that is, identified flying objects because they are not unknown space visitors but identifiable as Russian Cosmospheres. In some cases, though, combined sightings are taking place which involve both Cosmospheres and true UFOs. In the past, UFOs have always been attracted by aircraft, rockets, and spacecraft, especially when these are new or experimental. The Cosmospheres are no exception to this rule. Wherever Cosmospheres are congregated nowadays over military targets, UFOs occasionally show up and dart around among the Cosmospheres. The best known case of this type so far happened recently in New Zealand. Late last month on the evening of December 30, an Australian television news crew made headlines worldwide by filming what they called UFOs from an airplane over New Zealand. The film, some seven minutes long, was purchased by the BBC and by the CBS Television Network. On January 2, CBS showed less than 50 seconds of the film, which showed a glowing spherical object, and most of the objects sighted that evening by the camera crew and other observers were described as spheres of light. However, as the film clip was shown, a soundtrack was played. The Australian newsman described a different object. He said it looked like quote, a flying saucer, unquote. Walter Cronkite did not say whether or not the soundtrack had been recorded simultaneously with the film clip that was being shown. In any case, the spherical object in the film was a Russian Cosmosphere. But the attempts to discredit the film are an echo of the ridiculous government stories about the airquakes last year. On the evening of January 25, just six days ago, Walter Cronkite of CBS News reminded viewers of the New Zealand UFOs. Then he went on, quote, Well, the New Zealand Air Force reported today that freak atmospheric conditions, not visitors from outer space, were responsible. Investigators said one definite cause was an unusually bright Venus rising in the eastern sky, unquote. My friends, the recent flurries of so-called UFO sightings over Australia and New Zealand are actually due to Cosmospheres, and with good reason. Lately we are hearing a great deal about plans for America's so-called MX mobile missile, but in fact America mobile missiles are already being scattered like popcorn worldwide. Our Bolshevik rulers are hoping to outflank Russia with sheer numbers of missile sites, if nothing else. The missiles involved are based on our standard Minuteman. As a solid-fuel rocket, it is well suited for mobile basing. In fact, this was designed into some versions of the Minuteman in the first place, and now New Zealand is host to two American mobile missile bases. One is not far from Hamilton on the North Island. The other is near Alexandra on the South Island. They are concealed in mountainous areas. Likewise, a very large missile complex is in the Northern Territory of Australia. It straddles the Robinson River and spreads out over an 18 by 22 mile area. In that area there is no one to watch what goes on but alligators and aborigines. The Russians are keeping close tabs on all American missile bases, new and old by means of their Cosmospheres. As I've explained in the past, their particle beam weapons can blast our missiles at the moment of launch. 
but our Bolshevik rulers believe they have devised a way to disable the Cosmospheres just long enough to get the missiles safely launched against Russia. Scientific intelligence analysts in the United States understand that the Cosmospheres hover by floating in the Earth's electrostatic field. They also presume that the Russians use the same techniques we would in order to aim their particle beam weapons, that is, a combination of infrared detection and radar. They reason that if the Cosmospheres can be disturbed from their hovering positions, and if their sensing systems can be blinded, their particle beam weapons will do no good. Even if they fire, they will be aimed wild and will miss our rockets as they are launched. The solution they have devised is called a cobalt ionization bomb. Unlike a normal cobalt bomb, such a device is not designed to create a tremendous blast. Its primary purpose instead is to create tremendous quantities of totally ionized cobalt. That is, the cobalt atoms are stripped of all their electrons, leaving bare nuclei. The plan is to detonate these at various locations in the upper fringes of the atmosphere, as high as possible, but below the hovering altitude of the Cosmospheres. The result will be an enormous storm of electrons spreading horizontally in the Earth's magnetic field to pass underneath the Cosmospheres. This, they believe, will briefly disrupt the electrostatic field around each Cosmosphere, and also the infrared and radar systems used to watch the missiles below. And while the Cosmospheres are briefly incapacitated in this way, our rulers plan to launch our ICBMs right past them. Meanwhile, ground-based high-power lasers will be used in an effort to shoot down the Cosmospheres. But, my friends, our masters are falling victim to the very intelligence gap which they themselves brought about years ago. Because the Russians well understand the importance of surprise, including technological surprise. And so while they have allowed their space triad to become known in intelligence circles because of its deployment, they still have a master secret weapon in reserve for the war itself. This weapon is a system to protect the Achilles heel of their beam weapons, the ability to aim them accurately. It is called Psychoenergetic Range Finding, or PRF. PRF does not rely on conventional radiations like infrared or radar. Instead, it is based upon detection of the actual atomic signature of the target and normal jamming techniques have no effect on PRF. So when the American Cobalt ionization bombs explode, the Cosmospheres will be able to aim right through the electron storms to blast our missiles. And so, my friends, day by day the atheistic Bolsheviks are leading the Anglo-Saxon West into the cauldron of thermonuclear war. Already we can sense the impending doom in our nostrils. Yet still we refuse to do anything to stop it. If we allow Western civilization to be dissolved, will the survivors dare to say, May God forgive us? Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.